people uh, joining us uh, as, as the time passes. Um, the first order of business is the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Mr. Mangles, would you like to lead the pledge? You have to unmute yourself. Sure thing. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America. Yeah. and to the Republic, the Republic for, which for which it stands, one, one nation, one nation for God, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, indivisible with liberty and justice, and justice for all. For all. Uh, you know, since this is a, a, a non-business doing meeting, I'm going to uh, uh, sort of skip the roll call tonight, and uh, the and uh, Telesco can get the names off the screen. I think would be the way to do this, and we can uh, uh, proceed with our our meeting. This is a meeting that the uh, Harper Commission some commissioners requested uh, to be to get further information so that we understand uh, better the proposed changes in zoning. Obviously, the commission, our Harbor Commission and the Shell Fishers Commission, our, our interests have to do with uh, areas uh, around and connected to the water here. But I think it's uh, will help us do our, a better job as commission leaders to have this uh, kind of explanation of exactly what's going on and give us the opportunity to ask questions uh, of the two people here from from PNC, Brian uh, Baker, who you he'll remember as our previous uh, staff liaison for the Harbor Commission, and uh, Steve Kleppen, who's the director of planning and zoning. So, I'll turn it over to to Brian and and Steve. Let's share my screen. All righty. Uh, so good evening, commissioners. Uh, my name's Brian Baker. I'm the principal planner with the city of Norwalk. Um, so we're going to kind of go through um, what we've been doing in planning and zoning, which is uh, rewriting uh, the entirety of our zoning regulations. And as part of that is um, a big rezoning of, of the city of Norwalk. So we'll start with sort of the, the purpose, the intent and the goals of why we're doing this. Go over some of the big picture items, you know, the things that are going to impact uh, the city. Um, we'll be a little bit light on that because I want to focus mostly on, you know, the waterfront area with you guys. Um, so then we'll hit up the the industrial waterfront plan and the zoning changes as a result of that, and then kind of go over uh, where we're going from here. Uh, so the first reason why uh, we are proposing to rewrite the zoning regulations was. Um, right now, our zoning regulations, uh, they were originally adopted in 1929, and they haven't really been touched in any sort of uh, uh, big way in the last 30 years or so. Uh, so what happens is the regulations have become really confusing. Uh, they're really text heavy. It's hard for um, a citizen in Norwalk to uh, read them and understand uh, where you are supposed to look if you're looking at doing some sort of development on your property, uh, where your shed can go, or um, and then it, you know it's even difficult for um, you know staff to kind of figure out uh, you know everywhere you're supposed to look uh, in the regulations uh, in order to uh, best assist uh, people looking at uh, the zoning regulations. So a big component of this is simplifying and reducing the number of zones that we have in the city. Uh, there's currently 31 different zones in Norwalk, and five of those are uh, single-family only zones. Uh, so we are proposing to cut that down pretty much in half to go down to 14 zones. Um, and then included in that will be some overlays. Uh, what overlay zones are is they're essentially um, placed on top of the underlying zoning and they have some additional standards that people have to meet in order to do certain work on their property. So usually it's design related that uh, we want a certain area to look a certain way. So we'll uh, sort of spell that out in the regulations. And then this is going to make it easier to view and simple, simpler to regulate. So um, in the regulations, the proposed regulations, there's lots of uh, pictures, there's lots of charts, there's lots of graphics, there's things that tell you sort of if this is what your property looks like, here's where you can build something. Um, there's uh, included in that are um, lots and lots of definitions. If you were to go through our zoning regulations today, um, there's plenty of uses that are permitted throughout. Norwalk, but we don't say what that use actually is. So uh, in the, in these regulations, uh, anytime there's a use listed, 
or a word that's capitalized, that means there's a definition associated with it. So there's uh, pages and pages of definitions, and it's it's very helpful because it kind of takes away um, sort of that discretion or uncertainty in what a use is and kind of specifies exactly what we're talking about when we list a certain use. Uh, so here's the existing zoning map uh, in the center of your screen. Um, so the point of this slide is to show you sort of how confusing it is um, to look at um, and then for us to regulate. Uh, so uh, on the right side is a blown up uh, portion of Main Avenue up near the, the uh, Merritt. And what you can kind of see is uh, Main Avenue running north to south. And then uh, so you come off Main Avenue and you start moving west in the city. You're going to go from a business zone to an industrial zone. You're going to start going into a residential zone, back to a mixed use zone, back to a residential zone, back to an industrial zone. So there's really uh, a lot of confusion to it and sort of no flow. Um, what we kind of think is that you should start um, having, you know, I, along a major corridor or uh, near some sort of uh, uh, mass transit center and have your most density there. And then as you kind of move away from that, you get less and less dense the further you get from, from that point. So the existing zoning map doesn't really consider that. Um, and that's just a, a product of it um, having existed for so long and sort of, uh, you know, have it, not having a comprehensive rewrite in such a, such a long time. So we wanted to align our zoning districts with the comprehensive plan and the plan of conservation and development. So within the plan of conservation and development, there's a future land use map, which we, we referenced as a guide. Um, we wanted to focus our development near mass transit, near our infrastructure, and near our jobs. Uh, the kind of the goal is that if you do this, um, you can focus your density in areas where people won't need a car to get everywhere that they want to go. Um, they can hop on the train and go to the city. They can walk to a corner store. Um, they can walk to go get their haircut or their doctor's office. Um, they're sort of already in places that have been built. Um, and so we are not, you know, sort of developing our green spaces, whatever's left of them. We're focusing our development on infill and sort of redevelopment. And then lastly, we wanted to develop a form-based and hybrid zoning code. Uh, so what that means is form-based looks mostly at sort of what a building should look like in an area and less so on what the use that happens in that building is. Um, so kind of what the intent is is we would like development to look nice in Norwalk and put a little bit less uh, concern into the use, but we will still be concerned with the use. Um, but then when you get into those single family only areas, uh, that kind of goes away. We're not gonna tell you what your single family house has to look like. Um, so that's kind of the hybrid option. It's the, that typical uh, Euclidean zoning that we're used to merged with the new form-based zone for our mixed use and commercial areas. So here is a map of um, areas in Norwalk where we want to focus our density and, and our future development. Uh, so you can see uh, we have South Norwalk, which is uh, highlighted here with the train station, and then sort of that half mile buffer for, for our kind of a TOD area or transit oriented development area for walkability and mixed use kind of options. Uh, we had East Norwalk, which is uh, right over here with the other, the other train station. And this is um, same kind of premise, but at not the same scale as South Norwalk, obviously uh, East Norwalk and South Norwalk are, are different areas. So um, they'll have sort of different development patterns going forward. Um, Merritt 7 up here at the North End where we have the, the North 7 development uh, uh, that was approved. Uh, the master plan was approved uh, the last couple of years. So we're expecting that development to come in soon. And you also have the, uh, the office towers there which are some of your uh, largest employers in the city. Uh, moving down South, we have uh, the hospital. Uh, to, what we want to do is focus this one of the major, the hospitals, if not the most, one of the most, uh, uh, the biggest job center in Norwalk. They employ the most people. So what we think is that we should focus a little bit more density in that area so that folks who work there can walk there. Um, and then lastly, we have <clears throat> the Route 1 corridor shown here going uh, west to east. In the yellow, um, it's a major infrastructure uh, uh, corridor in Norwalk, major road network. So we kind of use that as a, a an area where we would want to see a little bit more um, development, move away from those typical strip malls that we see with big parking lots, um, and more towards some uh, 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 mixed use options. 
Uh, so I kind of talked about this already, but the, the hybrid code, um, it mixes those uh, traditional and Euclidean zoning types, which are uh, designated for single family areas with the form-based approach uh, for your, your commercial and mixed use uh, uh, zones. Uh, so that typical Euclidean zoning kind of means that you're separating based on use. You're kind of saying, here's where this use goes and um, not many others can go in this area. Form-based again, kind of um, focuses less on use because it kind of wants to incorporate all different use, uses in one area so that you can walk to uh, those, those buildings and focuses mostly on what the building is supposed to look like. So this is kind of a precursor to um, what we're going to call some of the zones going forward. Uh, so this is a uh, sort of a national model of form-based zoning. What they do is they base uh, the zones on these uh, five different transects. Uh, so you start at one, uh, and as you kind of increase in number, it's kind of the denser or the more uh, 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 sort of develop, uh, denser development pattern that you'll see. So um, what we did is we started at transect number three, because um, uh, one is sort of your natural untouched landscape, which we really don't have in Norwalk. Two is, is extremely rural, sort of like your agricultural area. So you're still not really in Norwalk yet. And then as you get to CD3, or the number three, that's where you kind of get into uh, the outskirts of Norwalk. That's your suburban uh, single family areas. Moving closer to the center of the city, you'll get to CD4, which is, uh, so you'll start to see some mixed uses. You'll start to see multifamily. You'll start to see some small offices, that kind of uh, uh, building type. And then you'll get to CD5, which is like South Norwalk up through West Ave, Wall Street. And then special districts, um, these are sort of areas that don't fall into those typical development pattern categories. Uh, these are like your industrial areas, uh, marine commercial, the hospital, they're the, you know, sort of outlier areas that need their own kind of uh, individual zoning. And CD in this case uh, stands for community district. So that's kind of just our nomenclature that we're using for our zones. All right, so the kind of big picture changes uh, that you'll see is um, we had discussed sort of the uh, consolidation of a lot of zones. Uh, so uh, the existing AAA residential zone, which is single family only, one acre minimum lot size, that's going to essentially be converted into what we're going to call the CD3L. So community district three based on that transect we just looked at, and then L stands for large lots. Next, uh, the AA, the A, and some of the B residential zones, those are all single family only. Uh, those uh, mostly got merged together and they became the CD3S, so the community district three, and then S stands for small lots. They'll continue being single family only lots going forward. B and some, uh, some B and uh, the C got merged into uh, the CD3. Um, so the C zone today is a two family zone. B is a single family zone, so there were areas uh, around the outskirts of where we were focusing our development on, which we thought made sense to allow for two-family housing. So that became the community district number three. And then you start to move up in that uh, numerology. So you'll see the neighborhood business and the de-residence de zone, uh, both multifamily. Uh, the only difference between the two is neighborhood business allows for some small commercial uses. We're proposing to combine those into the CD4. Um, so the big change here is uh, the D resident zone, you'll allow, be allowed to start uh, putting on like a first floor office or a first floor retail use, um, something like that. Again, based on that, uh, you know, maybe we can start replacing some of our car trips with walking trips. Business number one and business number two, that's along Route 1 and Main Ave. Uh, we're combining those into the CD4C. That's kind of self-explanatory. There are two zones that were kind of saying the same thing. Uh, so we just put them into one. Um, and then you get into uh, South Norwalk through the West Ave Wall Street corridor. Uh, there's a, I believe it's about six zones that make up that stretch, and they're all kind of trying to do the same thing. So what we did is we just combined them all into the CD5. And again, the biggest focus was focusing future development in the city around mass transit, our jobs, and our infrastructure. So we kind of use these quarter mile buffers around uh, the train stations, um, the major job centers, and those uh, big road networks like Route 1 and said, 
this is about as far as people are willing to walk before they say they'd rather drive. So we're going to do these quarter mile walk sheds uh, to help us kind of draw up our zone lines. Um, other changes that are of interest to you uh, on the Harbor Commission, um, we are going to start regulating impervious surface coverage. Um, today, we only regulate how much building can take up a lot, but we don't regulate how much impervious surface is on your lot. So we don't look at your driveway and um, all those kind of, uh, you know, your patios and things that are going to stop water from getting into the ground um, or running off your property. We're going to start regulating that. So we're actually going to put a cap on it. Um, we're going to regulate grading and vegetation and tree removal. So you'll actually have to get permits if you're um, clear cutting a lot or doing a large scale, uh, you know, uh, uh, revegetation of land and then grading. Um, we don't regulate that today, um, mostly. Um, so uh, we're actually going to require that uh, if you are doing a large amount of fill, you have to come in and get permits through planning and zoning. Um, and we're going to regulate how much fill and what the grade of the fill can be so that you're not causing, uh, you know, flooding onto your neighbor's property. Um, we have sustainability measures on larger projects. So this includes, you know, green roofs, solar panels. Um, a lot of that stems from, uh, you know, some large projects that come in with a lot of roof area. And that roof area goes unutilized or they put in a big parking lot. And now you have just a massive amount of impervious surface on a lot. Um, so we're going to actually require that you put solar panels in, green roofs, um, those kind of things to help, uh, you know, alleviate some of that um, negative impacts of, of those type of uh, developments. Uh, we're revising the flood regulations. So the big change here is that we'll add in a reset if you're a residential property owner in the flood zone. Um, we don't let you reset the amount of work you can do to your house before you have to make it flood compliant. So we are going to add in a reset period. Uh, so that'll help you uh, put a new roof on your house, reside your house, do a kitchen renovation, bathroom renovation, um, and then not make you have to raise your house uh, once you hit a certain threshold. And then lastly, increase public notification. So one of the big things that we always get pushed back on uh, is an application will go for a public hearing and people will say, well, I didn't know about it. So we're going to try to come up with a way through the regulations by uh, requiring people who are applying for permits to notify people within a certain buffer area of the project. So all of that culminates in uh, the map you'll see on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, the left-hand side of your screen is the existing zoning map, and on the right is the proposed. Um, so we'll kind of dive into the, the waterfront areas in the next few slides. But kind of hoping that you see that uh, it's a little bit less confusing, less colors, uh, less sort of random, randomly dispersed throughout the city, uh, more of a kind of gradual, uh, you know, less dense use as you move away from your downtown core out to the outskirts of the city. Uh, so here's uh, some of the, the waterfront specific changes. Um, so they're really limited to uh, three areas within the Inner Harbor planning area. So the first being the Upper Harbor, uh, the next being the East Norwalk Basin, and then that kind of uh, is similar to the, to the Water Street Veterans Park area. Uh, within those uh, within those areas, uh, so the big zoning classifications uh, that'll come up are uh, CD4W. That is mixed use, kind of low scale, two and a half story buildings, um, commercial allowed on the ground floor. Uh, and the W, what the W stands for is waterfront. So there are areas where they are waterfront or near the water. 5W, that is um, higher density. So more similar in terms of density of what you'll see in, in uh, South Norwalk up through West Ave Wall Street, um, but it'll include sort of those waterfront or water dependent uses that are permitted. Marine commercial, um, so SD, that's that special district, and then marine commercial, uh, which you um, are probably very familiar with. That's the zone we have in Norwalk today. And then uh, the SD special district light industrial. So here's sort of what the zoning looks like. This is just kind of a preview if you haven't seen it already. Um, so again, very graphic, heavy tables, gra uh, images, things like that to kind of help you understand 
uh, what can get built on a lot. So this is the CD5W. So uh, again, waterfront areas with some more uh, uh, higher density uses and that kind of water dependent use on the ground floor, public access uh, requirements along the water and um, public views to the water. This is kind of moving down in terms of density. So these are smaller scale um, areas that are waterfront. So this is kind of what you would see in the Cove Ave area or um, along Rowayton Avenue um, in the Rowayton Avenue Village District. These are kind of two and a half story mixed use, uh, lower scale water dependent sort of uh, uh, uses allowed on the on the first floor. Uh, the the part of the form based zoning is it discusses things like building types and frontage types. So uh, it kind of tells you this is what we expect certain buildings to look like in this zone. So if you are building a flex building, so this is kind of a, a commercial, uh, more industrial type building um, on the left hand side of your screen, it'll say what zones uh, it's permitted in. Um, it's going to tell you uh, sort of the uh, what you can build the building out of. So it kind of gives everybody an idea of what we expect buildings to look like in those areas. And then on the right is sort of uh, a frontage type. So this is obviously a, a, a water uh, a, a waterfront property. So on the back half, if they were to redevelop a property in one of uh, these specific zones, they would have to. Well, they wouldn't have to, but this is an option for them to uh, to provide public access. Um, they could do a boardwalk. They could do other sorts of public access uh, um, uh, frontages along the the water. Um, this is um, new to our regulations. It's not a new concept, but it's a use table. So what this does is it breaks down all of the uses that are permitted in all the zones throughout uh, Norwalk that we're proposing. And it tells you if it's permitted, not permitted, special permit required, or if there's limitations attached to that use. Um, so kind of the zones that um, are along our waterfront, I've highlighted in, in yellow. So you can kind of focus on those ones. Um, so you have the 4W, the 5W, and the Marine Commercial. And what it does is on the left-hand side of your screen, uh, you can see all the different uses. So these are the different marine use types, and it tells you if it's permitted in that zone with the P, not permitted, or if it's a special permit use uh, in the sort of yellow uh, circles there. So kind of what you can see is, you know, 4W is that lower scale. There's marine commercial uses, but there's marine uses allowed. Um, they're on that lower scale. Uh, as you move up to the 5W, there's some more marine uses uh, uh, permitted in that zone, and then you get to the marine commercial, and those are really, uh, you know, some of those water dependent uses. This is the same thing. This is just moving into, instead of the marine commercial or the marine uh, use category, now you're in the residential use category, so you can kind of see um, CD4W has that low scale residential, 5W has the higher scale residential, and then marine commercial has uh, I believe those are kind of a carryover from the existing regulations in terms of what residential type uses you could do. So here is the Upper Harbor area. Um, the map on the left is the existing zoning. The map on the right is the proposed zoning. Uh, so today within the uh, existing marine commercial uh, zone in Norwalk, there are 23 properties. They make up about 33 acres of land. Uh, within the proposed zoning, there will be 22 properties in the marine commercial zone, and they still make up that 33 acres. It's about a quarter acre difference. Um, but what you can kind of see is uh, the proposed zoning, which is here on the right side of your screen along the upper harbor. What it does is it converts a lot of this industrial, uh, heavy industrial area, and it proposes to rezone those into the CD5W. That's that uh, mixed use. Um, higher residential density uh, with uh, water uh, uses, uh, sort of water dependent uses permitted. Um, it has the public access requirements along the water. So if you're going to redevelop a property along here, you have to provide public access to the water and you have to provide view corridors so that people can see the water from, from the road. Um, and sort of, you know, we looked at the, the harbor management plan. Um, this is just a quote pulled out of the, the harbor, harbor management plan for kind of recommendations and guidelines, uh, which is uh, 
waterfront redevelopment consistent with the city re revitalization goals for the Norwalk Central Business District, which is uh, your West Ave Wall Street area should be encouraged and supported. So that's kind of, you know, we were doing our waterfront POCD plan, and that was kind of one of the recommendations that came out of that plan. Uh, this is moving south. So now you're really in the, the East Norwalk Basin on the right, and then you are in the, uh, the Water Street uh, Veterans Park area on the left. So um, really the biggest changes here, uh, we'll start with East Norwalk. Uh, East Norwalk has this neighborhood business zone. It's mixed use, uh, you know, so smaller scale commercial and residential uses. Um, we're kind of taking that existing stretch of neighborhood business and proposing to put it into the CD4, stretching all the way over to Liberty Square, it's CD4W, excuse me. So it's the same height, um, residential density caps at six units, but it includes that waterfront access requirement along properties that abut the water if they get redeveloped um, and those public views to the water. Um, on the Water Street Veterans Park uh, section, which is here, if you can see my cursor, uh, what the proposal is, is to sort of split that existing marine commercial area. The northern half is going to go into CD5W, and the southern half will remain in that marine commercial use. Uh, sort of uh, the idea is in this, this stretch of Water Street, a lot of these uses today aren't necessarily those water-dependent uses that we'd like to keep. You know, you start to see really those water-dependent marinas uh, located along uh, the southern stretch of Water Street. So we kind of followed that, and in keeping with if we're putting most of our, you know, residential density along here, it kind of makes sense to match it up. And then as you start to get south along Water Street, you have the, your light industrial down here, which kind of is more similar to your marine commercial. And so here's that kind of just blown up. Um, so the, the northern half of Water Street is that the CD5W, the more residential with the, the water uses is the northern half. And then your marine commercial is in this blue color here along this uh, southern half of Water Street. So you can kind of see the uses uh, that exist today. These are some of your truly water dependent uh, marine uses on the southern half. And then as you get north on Water Street, you kind of have some less uh, water dependent uh, uses, users along there. So you kind of have uh, restaurant users, you have boat sales. So both of those will be permitted going forward. Um, so they're consistent with the CD5W zone. And then in, in the marine commercial, you sort of, you really do have those boat repairers uh, and the marinas who who truly are marine, uh, marine water dependent. Um, and those uses are proposed to kind of stay there. Brian, going forward. Brian, may I ask you a very quick question? Sure. Uh, we have this slide up here. Notice on where it's have max, uh, uh, marine maximum formerly of Norwest Marine. Why was the demarcation made? Uh, do you see where you have South Oak Boat Club, I showed up, and, and Norwest Marine in this region right here? It's still a marine district. Why wasn't that blue line incorporated into this area here? And it went up, sort of that one section above. You see yeah, that? I think so. So what Marine Max does is they just do boat sales uh, mostly. Um, obviously, they do some sort of repairs. But so boat sales are a use that's proposed to continue in the in the 5W. Um, but boat sales isn't necessarily a use that, you know, it requires you to be located along the water. Um, so it kind of fits more in with the development you're starting to see across the street, uh, that 5W, the, the proximity to Washington Street and the train station. So that's where the line of demarcation was really just drawn. But they also still put boats in and out of water. They still, they, they do have, they do have uh, lifts, et cetera, bringing boats in and out of the water. Right. right, right. So that so that that'll be allowed to continue today. So there's really no change to their operation for so that use falls under both the 5W and the in the marine commercial. So that's something that, uh, you know, based on that user, um, you know, really, regardless of the, the zone, they can continue going forward. So, you know, the, the line doesn't impact them. One thing I was going to add to that, too, is uh, in, in discussing this with uh, within, you know, staff and as well with the commission is that we'll the Brian had showed you the use table before and there were, you know, the marine commercial use has other uses more water dependent more I'd say I would guess from it like an more intense from a water dependency point of view that we were going to recommend to the Commission to include in the CD 5w as well, so that way a, you don't worry about anybody becoming non conforming and B, um, you're kind of allowing 
multiple uses or a multitude of uses on those properties and kind of letting you know things play out accordingly. I think this is, uh, I believe, one of my last couple of slides. So this is just going over some sections of the harbor management plan where we were looking through sort of what what the guidelines and the policies are of the harbor management plan and sort of how the, the proposed regulations sort of meet those. Um, so I, I won't read these verbatim to you, but essentially it kind of focuses on uh, the big important things are um, making sure that new construction is flood compliant, um, having water dependent and water enhanced uses along the water, um, public access and public views of the water are really important. Um, and then kind of kind of trying to marry all of those you know, uses with each other, um, the, the water dependent uses, with the water enhanced uses, with the flood compliance, with water quality improvements and, and redevelopment going forward in the city. And then this is just next steps um, so that you are all aware of kind of where we're going from here. So tomorrow night is our first public hearing with the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, to discuss the, the proposed changes. Um, that meeting is uh, specifically just to kind of get public feedback so the public will speak. Um, and, and give their thoughts on all of the changes. Um, and then we'll do the same thing on June 28th, which is next Wednesday. Um, both of those meetings are hybrid, so they're in person or Zoom, whichever is easiest for you. Um, tomorrow is nights is in the community uh, room at City Hall, and then next Wednesdays is gonna be up in the Common Council Chambers. Um, so there's gonna, there's gonna be no action taken at either of those meetings by the commission. They're just for public input. Uh, July and August, what we're gonna do is take all of that input that we've got, um, and sort of have the commission mull those uh, thoughts over, recommend changes, anything that they think is necessary. And then hopefully at the end of September and October, we can um, hold some hearings for a potential adoption of the changes. And then um, if that timeline sticks, then January 1st, 2024 would become the new effective date of the regulations. And I think that does it for me. I don't know if you guys had any questions. Sort of the that waterfront POCD plan was was wrapped into the, the proposed changes. So we the uh as part of that study, we we incorporated the, the proposed recommendations sort of into the proposed zoning. So that all kind of meshed together. Uh if you if you were um keeping up with what our original proposal was for the zoning, some of that waterfront area that we had shown was labeled as TBD, um, kind of dependent on that waterfront study being finalized. Um, and then going through common council with that and kind of getting some of their thoughts. So now we have that full proposal of what those uses and zones should be in the uh, along the waterfront. Questions for Brian and Steve? Laurie. Brian, quick question. Can you just review again which waterfront zones require public access and viewing or uh, waterfront access and public view corridors? Yeah, so it's the CD5W and the CD4W. So if you want to redevelop a property in either of those zones, you have to provide public access along the water and then a, a public view corridor. Okay, great. Because I thought when you were talking about the um, CD4W in East Norwalk, you had said, well, it's not required, so it's recommended, but it is required. Oh, no, yeah. So, yeah, so it's, so the public access is required. What they do, uh, the regulations, they list different like uh, frontage types, and they kind of give you options on kind of like what you can pick as being like an allowed option. And so boardwalk is probably going to be the most utilized one along the water. Thank you. Who else? Jeffrey Stedman. <laughs> well, I'm, I don't want to go before any of the commissioners, but uh, you know, I, I think it's a very impressive bit of work. And and Steve and Brian know that I my what my interest is in this, and it has to, it relates to the coastal management policies. So you talked about the last major zoning um, change affecting the waterfront, and my recollection is back in 1988 when the marine commercial zone was established. And that, so my, my question is, how, how do you relate all this to the municipal coastal program in Norwalk? And so my, again, my, my experience going back, and that's when I first began being involved with this, is that there was a long history of, of developing Norwalk's municipal coastal program that began in the early 1980s 
and in 1982, the, the, uh, the plan of development was amended. But the development of the municipal coastal program also required the amendment of the of zoning regulations in an appropriate way. And that didn't take place until 1988 because of, because of a number of things, in, including the objections of the wa waterfront property owners along Water Street. So the Marine Commercial Zone, it took until 1988 to, to uh, adopt that, and that was the completion of Norwalk's Municipal Coastal Program pursuant to the Coastal Management Act. And I still remember when that took place, there was a ceremony at, at the Maritime Center at the time uh, to certify that, that uh, completion of the program. The following year, as you probably know, is that the Planning and Zoning Commission was split into separate Planning and Zoning Commissions, and the Zoning Commission amended the Marine Commercial Zone, and it made it more it loosened the restrictions because one of the objections of, of the property owners had been that it was going to restrict the potential for residential development uh, uh, in, in along Water Street. So the zoning commission, when it was split off, they changed the zoning regulations, made it less restrictive, and the DEP at the time sued the zoning commission for 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 uh, non-compliance or violation of, of the Coastal Management Act. So my my question is now, you're, you're changing the, the Marine Commercial District along Water Street. You're also proposing other zoning changes. And, and again, my interest has always been in the Coastal Management Act. How do you relate that to, to the Norwalk's Municipal Coastal Program? So that, that's my long-winded first, first question. And of course, that, that requires submittal and, and, and uh, comments from the Commissioner of now Energy and Environmental Protection. So in effect, you, you are changing that. So how, how, do you, how do you then present this as, as consistent with the Connecticut Coastal Management Act? That, I guess that's my first question. I got, th th thanks for listening. Can we take a seat or you want me to go? Yeah, I'll start and jump in. So I, 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 um, we've been in contact with Marcy Balin pretty consistently through this. We, we gave her a heads up that we were doing the zoning over um, as Brian mentioned, there were several areas on the draft zoning map that were TBD, and now we have a, a D at this point. Um, so hopefully by the end of the week, I'm going to get her a detailed memo uh, outlining the changes to the zoning um, for the areas uh, in concern. I think uh, Water Street will probably be her top concern area, I would guess, um, based on that. The other areas, and I'll go back, I'll circle back to Water Street. Um, you know, the, the upper harbor areas, um, there is no marine commercial zoning up in that area right now. Uh, there's industrial and or mixed use zoning. So I, I, I think I could make a logical argument that the CD5W is actually more consistent with the Coastal Area Management Act than the industrial zoning is, for example. Um, and and that, that would be, you know, the one caveat with that would be the inclusion of some of those other uses being permitted in the 5W that currently are allowed in MC. So I think if we migrate those uses over, I think, you know, I could make the argument we're really not changing anything. But I, I mean, that would be kind of a sneaky statement just because, you know, the market forces might dictate other uses for those properties as well. Um, for Water Street, I think that's been, you know, a, a big discussion item um, amongst the city, amongst, you know, Marcy's commented on a bunch of times. So, I, and, you know, we were doing the waterfront study itself. That was a big focus of conversation about um, if you change it, should you change it? You know the history of changes before, and then the impacts, and you know who didn't like it, who liked it. Um, I can tell you, and you guys would know this a lot more than I would. When we were doing the outreach for the waterfront study, we had differences of opinion between the tenants and the property owners of some of those properties on what they want to see. Um, they don't know, they're definitely not all in agreement on things. So we're trying to come up with a, a scheme that A, maintains the integrity of the district, but also gets at some of the things that we're hearing from a lot of other people in terms of, and, and it's not going to be appropriate for every property, but increased public access. Um, and another big thing, which I think sometimes gets fallen by the wayside, but I think is something that you guys would be in agreement with is improved water quality, because a lot of times those properties right now have, you know, maybe they're 100% impervious surface with direct runoff right into the harbor. So that doesn't do, you know, that that increases the water temperature. It's not good for shellfish habitat or anything else for that matter. So I think those are the three kind of items that we're trying to balance out, like the need for 
the need for um, public public access with something that's more consistent with the area to the north and what's happening to the west of parts of Water Street, coupled with um, maintaining the water dependent use and, and the importance of the maritime industry to the city, but also looking at improving water quality. So trying to come up with a formula that accomplishes all three of those, I will say is probably one of the hardest things that I've tried to think about for the last two years, but I think it, it, we're trying to get in that direction. Oh, Jeff, you're Might muted. I ask you, uh, pardon me, just one other, one other question that, if you don't mind, um, you, you haven't talked about the flood, uh, flood zones and the special flood zones so that all of Water Street and the, the Cove Marina area and a, and a good part of, of uh, you know, that area between the, the railroad and the Straffolino Bridge are, are in the 100 year floodplain. So, so, you know, back in the late 1980s, when, when all the, the controversy over the Marine Commercial Zone was, 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 was playing out, the, the, the concern there, the primary concern was the impact that additional or new development might have on water dependent uses. But otherwise, the arguments are just the same as, as we're, we're hearing now. But there wasn't as much emphasis on, on the development and new development in the, in the floodplain. Now that's another significant consideration uh, in, in terms of the Coastal Management Act. And as we talked before, Steve, uh, you know, when we were doing this last year, DEEP has, has made uh, very straightforward statements in, in Stanford and, and New Haven and, and Stratford that they consider that proposals that would increase the residential density in the coastal floodplain are inconsistent with the Coastal Management Act and, and shouldn't be approved. And that, that's regardless of whether it meets the FEMA standards. So I, I, you, I'd like to hear you, well, it doesn't matter what I like, of course, but I, if you could talk about the, what, you're in, what you're thinking about in terms of, of guiding development away from the, from the coastal floodplain uh, or, or are you anticipating that as a result of these, there could be additional development in, in the uh, in the hundred year floodplain? And again, that's that's Cove Marina and, and Water Street and also the area of the Liberty Square area. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I can take each each one of those as you know, they're they're same question, but different areas. Um, so for Water Street, sure, I think that's a little bit of a conundrum. I and mean, I think that you get. And to be honest with you, I know, you know, Marcy's been pretty vocal about that and I understand her, her point of view, but at the same time, you're talking about some of the most valuable pieces of property in the city, given it's a quarter mile from the train station. Um, I don't think it will be good public policy for the city to just surrender that to um, say, oh, it's going to flood. We can't do anything down here. It's just, I don't think that's realistic. I mean, you know, we have to keep in mind the walk bridge and what happens post walk bridge with some of those properties that were taken, but um, I don't see that as a recommendation we would make long term for the city. It's just too valu valuable a piece of property just just to surrender and say, well, we can't do anything here because it's in the floodplain. You're al you're allowed to build in the floodplain. You have to build flood compliant structures. Um, our goal would be to make sure that a we're we're looking at not only the minimum standards that FEMA recommends, but then going beyond what those minimum standards are. Um, obviously the ground floor of any of those buildings is not going to be residential. They have to make sure they, you know, whatever gets built there, the, whoever lives there has to have safe access out of those properties. Um, and, and, you know, we do get mixed messages as well from just, you know, elsewhere because, you know, the city has been getting funding to build in the floodplain from other agencies because they recognize the valuable location of where these properties are. So again, it's, it's similar to, you know, striking that balance. Um, Liberty Square is a little bit different. Um, you know, the zoning, Liberty Square itself, where, where the existing buildings are, the zoning really is meant to preserve what's there as opposed to enhance. I know there are some properties just to the west that were taken as part of the walk bridge and what becomes of them in the future. I think that the, the, the waterfront plan kind of envisions a couple of different very plausible scenarios. Um, and that's the same thing we did with the kind of up where uh, Divine is and ONG with, with the plan itself. So the plan would recommend a couple different options. Maybe there's a mixed use with marine component. At the same time, um, perhaps you could turn it into green space. So the idea of keeping the plan separate is that, you know, maybe the city gets funding to buy one of those properties and they want to turn it into a park that the plan allows for those different options. 
whereas the zoning is more prescriptive on what you, the immediacy of what's going to happen on those properties. I think it's important too, is that Water Street at this point is pretty much entirely developed. So it's not like we're taking actual, like valuable uh, uh, coastal you know, uh, resources and, and, and removing those, these are lots that are essentially 100% paved. Um, and so there, you know, future development is just going to be redevelopment of those sites. It's going to have uh, new stormwater management put in, uh, to collect all that rainwater. Um, there's going to be a cap on the amount of impervious surface. There's going to be public access provided. So there's going to be a lot of, you know, public benefits, um, should those properties ever redevelop. Even. I, excuse me, I get the value and the um, uh, FEMA compliance, but uh, I didn't hear Jeff's question addressed fully um, with respect to the Coastal Management Act, um, maybe disallowing is too strong a word, but the increasing uh, density in that area. Can you speak to that? Sure. I mean, I'll try to answer the best I can. I, I think from our perspective, there are, you know, dueling forces at work here because if if this was um if this was an area that wasn't a quarter mile from the train station that's you know you know probably the most valuable land in the city for or arguably close to the most valuable land in the city i i would say yeah if it was you know three miles away and not surrounded by you know the other infrastructure and, and other amenities and um Things that make South Norwalk great, I would I would say yes, but I think there's other forces that the city has to consider as well. Not not that not to say we ignore the coastal area manage, coastal area management act, but there are other factors that we have to weigh as well. But Stephen, haven't you maximized the density on the other side of Water Street? I mean, on specific properties per zoning, I'm sure that some of them are are, are maxed out. So what it seems to be is you're extending over into the strictly water dependent use or commercial. No, dependent. well, I mean it's not strictly water dependent use now. You can do you can do residential on any one of those properties now. I mean, the other thing too, and I understand you know where you're coming from. It's just trying to strike a balance here, and not only a balance with the. Um, what I spoke about before, but also a balance with what everybody's vision is for this area. Um, you guys have a specific vision and, a, and or some of you may be different amongst yourselves, but there's other folks, you know, you go to the common council meeting and they uh, will tell you something, what their idea is completely different than what a lot of you are probably expressing. So it's trying to, again, strike a balance. We may not get that balance where to anybody's satisfaction, but we're trying to get, get the closest we can. I think it's important too is that you know that that public access component like that's a huge part of the harbor management plan and the coastal management act um you know it's hard to provide public access to the water through boat yards and, and marinas you know it's kind of dangerous to get people to walk and get to a boardwalk back there so you know there's kind of that balance where you you might need a lower intensity uh in terms of marines dependent uses um in, in order to sort of achieve that Yeah, so Dr. Pino uh, spoke of that southernmost um, CD5W area on uh, Water Street. So um, just proposing this hypothetically, um, if that property was developed, it looks like it could be four, four and a half stories, uh, whatever, um, we could essentially lose that marina and have a walkway instead, and that would be compliant. Well, that you, technically today, you could that same situation could could happen based on the existing zoning. So, um, so, so then we should fix it so that can't happen. I mean, this sound, sort of sounds like Yacht Haven Light to me. Well, I guess that just depends on your your perception, I guess, of of what's appropriate so, so, there. So the net loss of boat slips in Norwalk is acceptable. Well, so I think. One thing too is that with that water dependency, they're going to have to have that um, that as part of the equation. There, it's it's may not be the principal driver on the property, but it definitely would be part of the equation. I mean, from a I think from a common sense point of view too is that if if someone's going to develop that property, the the clientele that they're going to target is 
going to be, you know, definitely folks interested in boating in the boating community. The, the slips that are there, I can only imagine are a significant asset to that property financially. Um, so I would definitely think somebody would include those as part of any future uh, redevelopment scenarios that, that would occur. When I speak of net loss, I talk of the number of slips. So then that could be developed, let's say, in that waterfront um, uh, uh, lineage could go to three or four large yachts and not the same density of smaller recreational boats that it is now. I guess theoretically, you guys would know more about how the, the slips are managed than than you. No, no. I mean, you should be able to answer that, though, Steve. I mean, yes or no. I, I would so so if if the if the slips are private and under somebody else's control, they can manage those however they feel appropriate. If they make more money with fifty large slips versus a hundred small slips, I'm sure they'll run the numbers and then you know reformulate appropriate. Thank you, sir. Well, Mr. Stedman, unless anyone else has some other questions, um, just a, a couple of comments. In the Upper Harbor, and, and I, Brian, that you talked about that there was a narrow strip of, of blue colored, uh, a blue colored zone along the wet, upper, upper Harbor on the west side and on, on the east side. What, what, what does that, what does that allow for? That was a 5W. Yes, yeah, so on the right on the right hand side. So that that would include where Divine Brothers is is now. Then, yeah. So the the zoning proposed for that ju just the um, the so yeah, starting on the east side, which was the O and G site. That's on the right side. Mm -hmm. The zoning is pretty similar to what you can do today. It actually drops the height down a little bit, but otherwise it's the same um, same thing to with where Divine is. They're both pretty similar. Um, but it drops the, the height down. So it actually takes a little bit away, I guess you could say. Um, going south of that, that where the two um, kind of wider parcels are, that's those are King industry properties. Yeah. Those yeah. are currently zoned um, I-1. So those would return to um, you know, a, a Marine, that 5W, which would have a Marine component to it if, if they ever did redevelop. So I think that's one area where you can say water strip you took, you're, you know, you'd be potentially taking away, but I think up here is where, you know, you're adding back in. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm not questioning that, but it's interesting that when the walk bridge plan was presented to us, one of the arguments for it was that that would, that would facilitate or encourage future water dependent uses requiring the bridge to open in, in the upper Harbor. So those, those, those uses that might've been envisioned then are certainly not the, the, the indu marine industrial uses of, of the sort that, that used to be there. Um, I mean, it, it's what it is, but it, it, I just think back to that argument that you build a walk bridge that there would be more, more uh, com marine commercial traffic in the upper river. Um, the, other, the other question I have is, is the Manresa Island, Steve and Brian, what, 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 what is that proposed to be rezoned at or zoned? Um, so that's, the, it's equivalent to what it is today uh, in terms of it's a lower, it's a single family residential zone. My guess is that if and when the the main portion of the Manresa property redevelops, something will have to happen zoning wise to kind of facilitate things. We, we, we have a really good understanding of what the neighbors out there don't want to see. So, uh, we're, you know, we're de definitely cognizant of that as it redevelops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a B zone today, Jeff. So single family only. It's CD three S under the proposed, which is essentially the same thing. Yeah, I think you can expect a development proposal there in the not too distant future. But my only, my other, only other comments would be that you know we, we talk a lot about resiliency planning and and the resiliency study in in South Norwalk. But I, I just think this, it just my opinion is a matter of policy. And my understanding is that the purpose of resiliency uh, initiatives or, or planning is, is to, well, of course, to, to try to increase the, or lessen the time it takes to restore uh, conditions that are damaged in, in, a, in a flood, but also to reduce existing vulnerability. And, and I think you could argue that, that 
you know, it, the intention of resiliency planning is not to allow increased in, uh, increased uh, development density in, in, in the coastal floodplain. And, I, and again, my interest is that, and, and you know that when deep comments on, on these proposals, their comments are not regulatory, they're, they're advisory. So municipal planning authorities can, can act in a, in a way that's not consistent with deep recommendations. But I think it all it gets to the you know the relevance of the what, what's the future relevance of the of the coastal management program, um, and I think that's something that we should we should keep in mind because some of us were involved in the development of it in, in Norwalk many, many years ago. But uh, anyway, I, I my my comments for what it's worth. This is this is impressive work and a lot of effort went into it. And as Steve mentioned, that there, there are differing different opinions um, about all of this and. Uh, you know, in the age of rising sea level and concern about resiliency and sustainability, you know, a, a good argument can be made that increasing development in the coastal floodplain is not consistent with with the uh, coastal management objectives. But that that's just my. This will be what it is. We'll go through the process. Um, th thanks, thanks for listening to all my comments. <clears throat> Any other questions? Um... Another item right on our agenda is the uh, waterfront study and the POCD amendment. I'm not exactly sure the uh, uh, what that is, why that's there. Sure, and I can go over this very briefly. Um, the 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 actual waterfront study um, was completed. I'm going to say last summer or last fall. Now um, it was officially referred out to your body um, in November. Um, but we kind of, uh, which kind of led into some of the zoning discussion we, we had just a few minutes ago, uh, set, you know, got to the Common Council level and Common Council wanted to see some changes and recommendations to the plan, which kind of precipitated into the, the zoning we just talked about. So um, that's more or less, I wanted to give you an update on that because that action itself, if you wanted to provide comments on, is probably a good time for you guys to take a look at that um, and get us those comments. The Planning and Zoning Commission will be probably taking action on the waterfront plan. I'm going to guess sometime in September, maybe early September at their first September meeting. Um, I anticipate getting hopefully the Economic Community Development Committee of Council's um, final okay on their end of things um, at their Jul first July meeting, which is right after the fourth. So they're they're kind of similar to. Um, how your body works in, in regards to the referral. We refer it to the Economic Community Development Committee and Council because we have to amend the POCD. Common Council has to um, vote yay or nay if they, uh, so, and again, similar to you guys, if the they said nay, the, the Planning and Zoning Commission could still override that. They just need, um, I think, a two thirds vote of the commission or super majority of the commission to, to make that call. So they're again, yeah, they're advisory, but again, we're trying to work cooperatively with folks. Um, the the changes were, you know, the the probably the three areas that we just talked about, the the upper harbor on the west side where Divine is, um, removing some of that heavy industrial designation along the the western side, and then allowing for um, the possibility of maybe that becomes park space if that ever was an option, or it has more of a mixed use public asset access component. Um, the other two areas where we just talked about a lot was the northern half of Water Street, which is proposed to rezone to the CD5W from Marine Commercial. That was something that they were pretty insistent on that they'd like to see. Um, and then the other area was, and I forgot the name of the marina there, just to the west of Liberty Square that the state took as part of the walk bridge. Um, so the, the plan had three options for that. The, the two options that remained or that the council would like to see remain, one would be like a green space option, two would be more of a mixed use type option with a water dependent component. And the third one was one the consultant came up with and they put it into a municipal category, basically saying if, if the city ever needed additional land, associated with the WPCA that you might want to consider having that as a third option. Um, Common Council was not crazy about that idea as an option, so they asked us to take that piece out. So um, what we're going to present to them, and I can give you a copy of this once we get it together, is just 
come up, come up with the, the verbiage for the Common Council for their suggested edits. And again, that's advisory to the Planning and Zoning Commission. I think the Planning and Zoning Commission will probably say the, they're fine with the edits, but you know, again, at the end of the day, it's their call. I'm happy to share those with you guys so you can comment on those. Um, at, you can probably add it onto your July or August agenda to go over it and then get the commission back comments, preferably by the end of August would be really good or mid-August. So we have time to look at those and um, you know, make a recommendation one way or the other before they take vote on that. And that's just the, the POCD amendment and the zoning is probably gonna follow a month, a month or so after that. Is that confusing or do you need me to pull up some maps or anything? Mm -hmm. You know, Steve, if I might say one other thing, that northern part of, of the Water Street area includes the property at 90 Water Street. And when we last talked with Eversource, as I'm sure you know, they're proposing now to run the, 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 the electric cables that will go under the harbor right down the middle of that property. Right. And so when we talked with them about it, they said, well, you could still develop it, but it, it could be a parking lot or a park. So that would seem, based on what they've told us in the past, would preclude redevelopment of that of that particular property. I well, that's going to be a very nice view corridor for one of the two, something like that. Or it could be public green space. Who knows? However, it plays out. Or maybe it's you know whatever. I would think though, if you're like a you know say there was a boat something boat related there, as long as there wasn't permanent infrastructure related to that property on that, that they could still park boats on it or do whatever. I would because the boats can get moved if they need to get in there and dig up and replace lines or whatever they need to do. Anyone else? I'd just like to say to, 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 to Steve that I think the, and Brian and all of the, and your whole department, that the the out, <clears throat> the outreach with this these uh, zoning changes has been really remarkable compared to anything I've ever experienced in living here for like nearly 40 years. It's just, it's just great to see the effort you guys are making to really reach out and, and talk to as many people as you can. And I'm really, really grateful that you're doing that. I think it's Thanks. Really I had terrific. to tune out when Brian was doing the presentation because I've done it so many times and heard it already. I couldn't listen. Well, that's what I was thinking. It probably... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Brian. So uh, is there any other questions, any other discussion? John? Uh, I, you know, I just, I just wanted to, Brian, I just wanted to go back just to clarify that one statement, going back to that original section on Water Street, where we talked about, you know, that, that section of the map where you, uh, yeah, let me pull it up for you, John. Not that one. Yeah, next slide. So let me move. There we go. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's in here. Yeah, I'm getting was was this an arbitrary decision to make? Because I just get the impression that uh, perhaps the owners of this particular property are giving them the option that they don't necessarily have to use that piece of property for more water dependent usage or industrial usage here. I was just wondering why, because it seems like kind of ordinary the way the whole line of the harbor is lined up here, why that why that's truncated in that in that fashion. So this gives the owner or the perhaps the potential owner the possibility of developing it in manners in which are different from commercial marine district. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, it, it, and again, a lot of it, you know, we, when we've had all our meetings um, citywide on this, you know, anytime there's a change, you know, at our end, it, it's the market's going to dictate what the highest and best use is on those properties. And so, I, I mean, I, I would understand the broader concern about if you, allow more dense residential there, the market might say, all right, that's more valuable than boat slips or boat docks or, or anything yeah. in, you know, related to that. Um, I, you know, and then Brian and I are happy to go back and take a look at the CD5W language again to make sure that the, that water-based um, component is a, a requirement and as well as in addition to the the just having public access, because like, I think having something, you know, if you have the ability to have boat slips, it should be something that's, you know, allowed and, and kind of encouraged versus something that's kind of nominal or, you know, maybe only benefits a few versus a broader 
broader group. It just got the impression that that sort of was sort of like the it stood out as far as why that was truncated in that in that fashion here, whereas everything above that I can see pretty much the way you've uh, had it arranged here, and it goes back to some of Jeff's questions too, because there was an option of that 90 Water Street section right here. Now that's going to be obviously all city owned property here and and no development is going to be taking place there, but certainly uh, development. Well, all right. I, I, yeah, that, well, that, what yeah. I would recommend if you guys as a, as a collective, if you have um, specific concerns, please put them in writing. Um, and then, you know, the, the, as Brian mentioned earlier that we have the public hearing on the 21st and 28th, but no action is going to be taken until We'll probably have at least one more, maybe two public hearings in the fall on on the changes. But over the summer, the commission is going to, you know, get all the comments and, you know, in addition to public comments, staff has come up with a whole list of things that we know don't work or we have to fix. So they're going to look at all those and they're going to um, weigh those and determine what gets included, what gets edited, or what to ignore. So if you had specific comments on you know, zoning boundaries or anything else, I would put that in writing and, and get right. that to Brian or I and or even Amelia, and then we'll get it to the commission and they can, um, you know, take a look at it. Right. Fair enough. Thank you, Manol. Is there a motion? All right, I'll make a motion to uh, adjourn the meeting. Second. Your second. All in favor? Aye. No. Brian and Steve, thank you very much for uh, for your time you. and uh, educating thank you. us. Thank you very much. Yep. Have a good night. Yeah, thank you, you very too. much.